we can give ourselves about uh, 10 or 15 minutes for questions. And of course, there's been a tremendously rich field of ideas here. So uh, I imagine there may be quite a few questions. And if so, I might, what I might do is ask two or three questions together and then open them to the panel. Yes, there's one, one here. I'm Sony Kapoor. I run an international think tank advising finance ministries and was an investment banker before that. But I want to go one step before that to when I was an engineer. And George mentioned the uh, physics envy that, uh, that economics has suffered from and finance in particular. But I guess it is important to learn lessons from the natural sciences and engineering in particular, but we've been learning lessons from the wrong sciences. So while we will never get to actually modeling human behavior, as you just clearly said, we can significantly improve by looking at, for example, the uncertainty principle, by looking at hysteresis in engineering, by looking at things like turbulence rather than lamina flow, by looking at sudden phase transitions, uh, which happen all the time in physics, uh, positive feedback mechanisms in control theory, uh, relativity for the interconnectedness of the system, etc. So, and then the clear lesson is what we've ended up with is a very complex and tightly coupled system, which as an engineer, you know, is bound to fail. And the solution probably, at least in finance, needs to be a more modular approach with loser connections, taking away the just-in-time financial system and the dependence on asset and liability liquidity that we've come to depend on with buffer zones and counter-cyclical policies leaning against the wind. So any comment on that? Please? I think that, that, that's a very, very interesting point and uh, perhaps Bill and Roman would like to comment on that. Uh, is there another question? Uh, well, let's have another question here. Yeah. And another uh, one there. Thank and you. We'll uh, John Evans from the Trade Union Advisory Committee to the OECD. Uh, nobody's mentioned income inequality or distribution as either a contribution to the crisis, and yet if you look at the US, the level of income inequality in 1929 um, was almost reached, I think, in 2007, just when the crisis broke. Um, I mean, how much is the failure of economics to actually discuss income distribution as an issue without seeing it as a normative question? Um, or something simply related to marginal productivity, part of the failings of either the analysis of the crisis or the failings of economics that has to be taken into account in the future? That, that's a great question. We have a session on that later on, but, and I, I will add a little bit before we open that to the panel. Yeah, third question. Thanks. Uh, my name is Francisco Anasi, and I'm a PhD candidate here at the University of Cambridge. Uh, I think I, find, I found intellectually um, amazing uh, yesterday's um, evening session in the sense that the beginning of this inaugural symposium, start of the symposium of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, started off um, with reflection on two people that were non-economists in the sense that Keynes started off, wanted to become a mathematician and then ended up being an economist by default, and Hayek, um, if I'm not wrong, had two PhD in continental Europe uh, for in, in political science and law. So, I mean, the plea for intellectual eclecticism, I mean, is always um, in tune with, with Cambridge, I think. My question would be uh, to uh, George Soros directly, but it, it's, it's also general uh, to, to, to the other speakers. What I'm puzzled about the theory of reflexivity um, is a very simple thing, in the sense that the theory of reflexivity is, to a certain extent, reflexive. So what I mean by that is that um, it seems to me, in my rudimentary understanding of the theory of re reflexivity, um, is that it is to a certain extent contingent on animal spirit, on the zeitgeist, on the mood of the market. So I wonder if, given the reflexive nature of the theory of reflexivity, uh, one does not run the risk of, um, in times of economic crisis, to set up uh, a theory of crisis, so what Paul Krugman will say at depression economics, and in times of economic growth, 
because of the reflexive nature of the theory, um, something uh, going in, in the opposite direction. Um, if I can add a final application, I mean, uh, I, I think that the, the theory in itself is, is deeply intertwined with the Merton family. I mean, there is a Merton uh, family test. Um, on the one hand, there is the, the sociologist Robert K. Merton. Just, who, just make your point, yeah. please. Yeah. Who set up, I mean, the, the self-fulfilling prophecies and, and unintended consequences. And on the other hand, I mean, his son, the Nobel Prize laureate, uh, Robert C. Merton. And I wonder, I mean, in the long-term capital management um, case, can we still apply reflexivity? It was a model, it was mathematical, but in the end, it was also reflexive. They thought that they understood the market and they were the market makers, and uh, I wonder whether that is also a litmus test. Thanks. Okay, so, so uh, we have uh, three points. Uh, let's, let, let, let's do them in order. Let, um, the, the control engineering thing, to what extent can we get some insights from that, Bill, and then Roman, and then I'll... Uh, I'll make a, one point that the supervisors at least have learned from, uh, learned from the engineers. Uh, when they first brought in um, the value at risk kind of concept, you know, to, to calculate the capital banks needed to hold against market risk, they did, the, they did the science in the sense that they used the VARs and they backed out how much capital people had to hold. And that was just fine. And then the supervisors multiplied by three. And the bankers were absolutely outraged that, that you should have this arbitrary uh, gross-up factor. But the reality, as I subsequently learned, and I think the point you were making, is that the engineers do this all the time. And they know that if they've got a fragile system, you have to do the science and then you have to say, but it might not be good enough. And so you gross up. So that's the first point. In terms of reducing the expected loss of these crises, which I think is what we're really talking about, I, I think there's three things that you have to do. And, and people are sort of groping towards it. One of them is you've got to lean against the upturn, uh, I think. You've, you've got to sort of nip this thing in the bud, as it were. There are various ways in which this can be done. The uh, last Basel Committee report, I think, was very useful. You've got to lean against the upturn. Second thing, and this is politically much more difficult, is you've got to be prepared to accept more downturn. That is to say, not more downturn relative to what we've got at the moment, but recognize the fact that if you allow little downturns to, as it were, burn out the undergrowth, you avoid the likelihood of a really big crisis. Now, that's politically hard to sell. The third thing I think we have to do is you've got to put a lot more emphasis recognizing that the system will fail into ex-ante preparations for the day of reckoning. And the question then becomes, do you have adequate deposit insurance? Do you have adequate memoranda of understanding? Do you have adequate uh, bank resolution uh, regimes? Do you have adequate international burden sharing regimes? Uh, do you have adequate understanding of counterparty risk, et cetera, et cetera? And all I can say in the context of the English, uh, Northern Rock and all the rest of that stuff, very sophisticated society, and even in Britain, none of those things had been put in place. Uh, George? Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I entirely agree with you that um, in many ways, natural scientists have been ahead of social scientists. And uh, I always, you know, the first complexity theory, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the Belgian physicist, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, um, Prigozhin. Prigozhin. Pri Pri yes, Prigozhin. Um, uh, that's really where I first found uh, some resonance uh, to my ideas. And as I said in my speech, uh, reflexivity can be interpreted as a feedback mechanism. It is a feedback mechanism, and there is negative feedback and positive feedback. So I, I think that there's an awful lot in turbulence and uh, earlier chaos theory and all that. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, so uh, I think there's a lot, uh, network theory now, uh, I think there's a lot to be learned from network theory. And yet there is some difference between human networks and, and uh, uh, non-human networks like telephony or, or, or electricity. 
And exactly what that difference is, uh, I haven't been able to identify, but I think it's more that certain things that come in at the margin in natural science uh, are right at the center of in, in, in human affairs. So I think there's a lot to, to, be, to be gained from, uh, from uh, uh, those uh, from natural sciences. They are ahead because, because they have a, an independent criterion for judging the validity of their theories. The big difference between human affairs and natural, that, or the big difference between Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and the human uncertainty principle, that when Heisenberg discovered his principle, it didn't change the behavior of, 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 of the particles or waves that he was talking about, whereas any social theory, whether it's Marx's the theory of history or the theory of reflexivity itself, it changes the subject matter to which it relates. And that, of course, is, is uh, very relevant to the third question, because the theory of reflexivity is, in fact, reflexive in that sense. Roman, did you, did you, did you, yes, would you like to say anything uh, about the use uh, of these very broad briefly, of mathematical uh, principles? Huge topic. Uh, let me just take, a, since I am mindful of time, let me just take a little slice of it. Uh, I, I, I think just a cautionary note that I think that because the system has failed does not mean that the models from other areas that have faced transitions and failures are the right model. And the reason for that is not actually the aesthetic, is that the whole reason why rational expectations has superseded the traditional Keynesian models was that Bob Lucas has managed to show that Keynesian models cannot be used for policy analysis because every time individuals change the way they think about the future, the model itself changes. Therefore, models do not, that do not, in principle, have feature of that kind will hardly be accepted by economists and probably should not be accepted by economists when it comes to policy analysis because we have to have some handle on these issues. The problem, of course, was what Bob Lucas proposed was that he thought REH is the solution to this incredible problem. And that solution on top of it is universal. But that insight that he had, which actually he got from that Phelps, does remain. And, not, and what I'm concerned about this model is, is this another way of saying what George Soros said, that the, I actually come from physics. I actually studied physics before I studied economics. It was just a little too difficult for me. But the, 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 the problem that these models have is that they can reproduce some of these patterns. They will not be useful for policy analysis, and I'm not, I'm not sure actually about their, uh, their ability to be taken to the economic data, economic time series data, as opposed to giving just a formal way of telling a story about the crisis. And final point I want to make is that in terms of future crisis, the same rule would apply. One would need to combine some kind of objective model criteria with some constrained procedures that the policymakers would not be bound by rules. That's another subject for discussion. But, and then I'm not sure how helpful these models will be. And all of this has to do with this main point, I guess, that, that uh, George Soros made, Lucas and Phelps, and, and, and goes back to Hayek and Keynes, is that the way people think about the future actually affects outcomes. And that is the difference that I am actually not sure how, you know, who knows, but I'm not sure how physical models can capture it, while I can see that they capture some macroscopic elements. Well, we'll be coming back to the question of, of different applications of mathematics uh, later. Uh, one thing that's baffled me, I can't uh, resist um, butting in, though, is uh, why uh, the economists who do want to use natural sciences as uh, a model or an inspiration, what they do, always focus on physics 
uh, which seems to be the least relevant natural sciences, rather than, for example, biology. And we've, we've heard of engineering, but biology. There are many natural sciences which are also incapable of the sharp probabilistic, uh, or sharp modeling, or even sharp probabilistic modeling, as Roman said, and they're very respectable natural sciences, and they use empirical observation, they use testing, and so on. Uh, why is it that we economists have this physics envy, as, as opposed to trying to operate by scientific principles, which you know, other social scientists and, and even natural sciences um, adopt? Uh, I think we shouldn't leave uh, this room, though, without uh, some comment on the income distribution issue as well, which I think is a very important one. We're coming back to it. But I'd like to turn around and actually throw, throw to Bill, uh, first of all, uh, in this way. It's clearly, there's, there's been an, an, an enormous widening of income distributions. One of the things that made that widening of income distributions politically acceptable was the great moderation, was the fact that uh, there were no recessions as a result of which the people who were getting poorer didn't get cyclically poorer as well as uh, structurally poorer. And also, one of the things that made the widening of income distributions acceptable was the growth of credit. It was what allowed people to maintain their living standards without maintaining their incomes. Now, if we didn't have this growth of credit, which Bill and actually George, you've both been objecting to over the last 30 years, isn't it likely that actually the whole economic reform process, the whole uh, vision of a market economy operating more successfully from the 1980s onwards, which is what we've all been led to believe, would have been falsified before it even started. You know, nearly everybody believes that to the extent that economics was reinvented in the 1970s and 80s, in some senses, the world economy has performed better over the last 30 years than in the previous 30 years. But actually, if it hadn't been for the credit growth, if it hadn't been for the great moderation, the entire one could argue that the entire Thatcher-Reagan experiment would have been not just a sort of modified success, but a total and utter failure, both economically and politically. And I'd be interested, Bill, in your views on that, because I imagine in some ways you're quite sympathetic to the uh, reforms that did happen in the 1980s. Yeah, essentially, I, I, I think what, you're, what, what you seem to be suggesting is that uh, without the growth, so we did have this problem, the growing income inequality, um, and in particular in many of the English-speaking countries of um, income growth and employment growth that was in a certain sense substandard by earlier, by, early, by earlier standards. And that if it had not been for the credit growth, keeping this whole thing going, that somehow there would have been a, a collapse of the capitalist system uh, much earlier on. Mm -hmm. And I actually don't think so. I, I, I go back to that point I made earlier about, uh, about forest fires and cleaning out the undergrowth. I think if there had been, uh, instead of the great moderation, some relatively sort of moderate downturns that had been allowed to do their sort of good work, both uh, uh, Keynesian, Hayekian, uh, or Schumpeterian, uh, I think we would have come out of this an awful lot better. We would have had people that would have been behaving better in successive upturns. Uh, we would have had write-offs of debt during the downturns that would have let, let people come out of it a uh, better place to, 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 to move ahead. So I think the, this goes back to something I think uh, Leon, uh, Axel Leonuf could, Leonuf would talks about uh, a lot about the sort of the, 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 the corridors of stability. And I think what's happened is that we've actually pushed the system because of the way that we've done it right to the limit of what the system can stand. And we now have a much more dangerous situation, not just economically, and, and this is something that needs to be thought about, not just economically, but, but socially and politically, than we probably faced since the 1930s. And I think, it's, I think it, had we had a bit more cleansing in a moderate and ongoing way, we'd be in far better shape than we are at the moment. Any other comment? Yes, George, and maybe Perry a, a word as well, because you're here. No, I think it's a, you, you made a very good point about, I think, uh, about what made uh, uh, the uh, widening of uh, income differ differences acceptable, namely the growth of credit and uh, the, the absence of, uh, uh, and in that context I'd like to make the point that 
we, 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 uh, when we look at China, we recognize that the, the, the Chinese uh, uh, leadership lost the mandate of heaven in, in Tiananmen Square, right? And they have to deliver 8% growth uh, to, to, they know they have to deliver it because, to stay in growth, in, the, in, in power. Uh, I think that somehow we have lost the mandate of heaven now. And, and uh, the, the uh, uh, inability to, to uh, uh, pursue a, 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 let's see, or reach some political uh, uh, consensus on what to do is putting us, as, 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 as uh, Bill White said, into a much more dangerous situation politically. So we, we are just heading into a period where you, you are undoubtedly going to have uh, substandard growth or perhaps uh, uh, even yet to slip into a, a, a recession if the global system falls apart. Uh, if, the, if the differences between uh, uh, the different uh, um, political, well, uh, different countries uh, lead to a breakdown in, 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 uh, in, in, in the system. So I think we are, we are, as you said and several people said, we are far from being out of the crisis because the imbalances that created the crisis have not been resolved. Perry, would you like to say a word as an economic historian and to yeah. just to close it off on that? Um, well, I, just to, to link up a couple of the comments that have been made, um, the, maybe, maybe with, with starting with, with Roman, the idea of imperfect, uh, thinking about individual behavior, um, just to link that up with the money view, the, the money view idea is, is thinking about the constraints on individual behavior. Okay, um, the, that, that, that sort of force people to a certain kind of limited rationality. Um, so it's not so much about, so it's completely compatible is, is, is first of all the, the point. Um, the second link is, is with the first questioner. Um, Sony, is that you? Yeah. The tightly coupled uh, systems versus robust systems. I mean, one of the, this made me think, one of the most important things in payment system design is exactly this, okay, that you want to make sure that the clearinghouse doesn't fail if an individual, if an individual person fails. This is where the rubber hits the road in, 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 in the liquidity constraint, in the, in, the, in the survival constraint. And we know about, so this is, this is about equilibrium versus these, th this is a very robust system where, where in, in, the, uh, in, in the, the, the payment system, and maybe could be the model, not only for uh, developing, uh, for, for, for theoretical development, not, not I mean, they, that imagining that everyone is solving infinite horizon, uh, infinite horizon dynamic stochastic programming problems, okay, and then that there are prices that are coordinating all of those behaviors, I mean, this is just not real, okay? What, what, what is really happening is people are paying their bills every day. Okay, uh, I think we, we, we'd better stop, right? Yeah, we're not, we're not. Okay, we're I'm sorry, I know there are quite a number of questions out there. Uh, we do have these devices, if you can, I'm sure by, by the end of, of, of this weekend, you'll work out how to use them, even if you haven't already, on which you can send uh, questions in. But of course, you know, the whole point of this conference is we all circulate and talk to each other. Anyway, thank you very much. I think that was a marvelous session. Thank you.